Hi, I'm uh, I'm Ryan Prairie, and uh, this is the talk that I'm doing. I'd also like to give a shout out to Stephen because I can see him in the chat freaking out. Um, so this chat is about uh, open source software, but you know what am I going over? I'm going over a bunch of stuff. I'm going over open source, what it is, open source licenses, Git, GitHub, and why collaborating like this and open source in, in general is really important. So who am I? I'm, I'm Ryan Prairie. Uh, I'm the head of technology for Computer Science Society. Uh, I've been programming for about eight years. Uh, I like open source software. Um, I've worked for companies like CIBC and BlackBerry. Uh, I make a bunch of cool things. And uh, I'm not good at spelling, even, even a little bit. Uh, so there will be a bunch of misspellings. So what is open source? So open source is the idea of having the source of something be open for redistribution. This could be images, software, hardware, and anything in between. You know, uh, sometimes open source software is called FOSS, or you know, uh, and it stands for free and open source software. Now, normally, open, so uh, open source software is under a license. So we'll talk about that next. Now, open source terms. Now, because open source is not like a single thing, it can be many things. One of its uh, key tenets is that it's uh, defined by the community. So one aspect that uh, there are 10 aspects that have been defined by one part of the community called the Open Source Initiative has been defined here. So we'll go over what they are, what they mean, and all that stuff. So the first one is a free redistribution. This one is fairly easy. So a free redistribution. You can take the code or whatever, and you can redistribute it freely as long as it's open. More times than not, free means uh, free as in freedom rather than free as in like doesn't cost any money. The next part is a source code. In our case, we'll be talking about source code, but it doesn't have to be source code. And it is that the source of whatever is under the open source license has to be open for redistribution for everyone. And so this will be, um, this could be, uh, if you're doing like Photoshop and you're, it's open source, this would be the Photoshop files. Or if you're doing like video, video editing, this would be the video files. Or if you're doing like programming, this would be uh, your source code. Now, um, derived works. So derived works are, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, I'll be taking questions throughout the entire presentation. So if you just have a question, just put it in chat and that's fine. Yeah, I see a question there from Jeremy. Do I need to pay to get a license? No, almost always uh, the licenses are free and open for distribution which is where the term open source. Now to publish software is a completely different topic and we will get to that. So derived works. So derived works themselves means that um, if you have a software and it's open source, and then I create a copy and I change some aspects of the software, I should be allowed to do that. I might not always be free to distribute it to everyone, but I will be allowed to make that modification myself. Now, the last one is integrity of the author source code. This one is a little fuzzy in what it means, uh, as this has to do with a lot of legal jargon. It's very uh, dense at times. So this one, um, I believe, from what I've read and understood, has to do with uh, the distribution and actually of a modified form. So not always, but a lot of times, the licenses will um, will say that you can distribute modifications and they normally have some caveats to them like you cannot pay for redistributions or sometimes they allow if you uh to pay for redistributions of the software um now uh, now, now to the next part no discrimination against a person of group or groups i made a typo twice uh <laughs> so um this one is a is self-explanatory, you're not allowed to discriminate uh, in the terms of this software to any person or groups. This could be like about their race or gender or anything in between. You're not allowed to do that. Same with the next one. The next one is a little bit more fuzzy 
And uh, it is talking about um, discriminating against a group of people, uh, not based on anything like that, but based on like, like what they're doing. So for example, if you create a software that is really good at text processing and, uh, and um, some lawyers want to use it and you really don't like lawyers, you're not allowed to say lawyers are not supposed to do that. Now, the last one is a uh, just, or the, the next one is a uh, distribution of license. So this is uh, talking about redistribution of the software and the actual license itself. Um, this one is a bit more complicated, but it basically means that the, uh, the software, the, the license attached to the software can, has to apply to everyone. It cannot apply to only a certain number of people or a certain group of people. For example, if I create a software, I can't have one license for lawyers and one license for everyone else. Now, the next one is a, it's a bit more complicated. License must be not be specific to the product. Now, license must not be specific to the product means that the license doesn't apply to the whole thing. So if I take, if I take a chunk of the code and put it somewhere else, that license still applies to that chunk of code as it applies to every aspect of the product, not just the specific whole as, a, as an idea. Now, the license must not be restricted to other softwares. You can't have a clause in your license that says you have to only use open source software with this software. Um, that's not allowed. And the last one is the license must be technology neutral. So the license must be able to work everywhere. Um, I can't have one license for smartphones and another license for computers or servers or anything in between. Now, the next part talks about what are licenses. I've been talking about like what are the aspects of licenses, but you might be confused. What are licenses? So just like some software that you would pay for, um, there are terms and services. And a license defines these terms and services. So as open source software is intellectual property of all of its contributors, everyone who worked together uh, to build it, there needs to be a license of what people can do with it. Now, there's there's three main schools of thoughts about licenses. We'll talk about that in a moment. But uh, let's say I, I'm using like JetBrains. They make uh, IDEs. Now, to apply, you have to get a license. And once you get the license, you can either pay for it or you can get an exemption. Then you use the license to use the software. Just like open source softwares, there is licenses. But open source software licenses are free and open for distribution, just like the core tenants that I talked about before. Now, these three schools of thought for uh, open source licenses are public domain, permissive, and copy left. They all have a some stories attached to them, but I'll gloss over most of them. So public domain licenses are fairly simple, just like anything like literature or movies or TV can be in public domain, so can your code. Now, there are two public domain licenses. The first one is public domain or PD. The next one is a Creative Commons based license. So Creative Commons is very complicated as a whole. Um, but its base license is just like public domain. If you attach it to your software, then all the code will be in public domain and free for everyone to use how they see fit. Now, permissive licenses. Permissive licenses have been around for oh, a while, probably since the 60s. Um, the first big one is called BSD, stands for Berkeley Software Distribution. And uh, BSD comes from the University of Berkeley um, or University of California at Berkeley. They have a, a very good computer science department and there they were making a bunch of fancy stuff uh, and they came up with this license to describe how people could use. Now, permissive licenses uh, normally grant people permissions. You can use this software how you fee see fit. You can make modifications and redistribution. You can distribute it and charge them. They're most of the time very open and only sometimes have some drawbacks. Um, another very, very common one is MIT license. MIT, uh, like its name suggests, was, comes from MIT. Um, and the last big one is Apache. Apache is a very important permissive license because um, Apache, which is a group that makes software, they decided that the other permissive licenses 
didn't cover all the aspects that they wanted to cover. So they made their own. And that's a common idea that you'll see often. Now, the next one is copy left. So copy left is the idea that um, your license, uh, your, your software, any derivations have to have either the same level, the same license or more restrictive licenses. Um, there's a reason why, and I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, the big reason is Richard Stallman, who is a very key figure in the open source community. Um, in the uh, 80s and the 70s, when he was a student and then professor at MIT, he created a program. And um, a company was like really wowed by this program, but they had some ideas to change it. So they asked him for a copy, and they got a copy. They made the modifications, and then Richard Stallman, seeing that it was better, wanted a, a, a copy of the new software. So he asked for it, and the company said no. So he was uh, understandably very upset. So he came up with this idea with his friend at uh, Harvard Law about copy left. Uh, copy left has been a term for a while, but specifically about legal implications, it is from Richard Stallman. Now, there are many important copy left uh, licenses. The GPL is the biggest one, it stands for GNU General Public License. Um, and then LGPL is the lesser GPL. And then AGPL stands for a Faro GPL, and then the Mozilla license. They all have different tweaks in between. Um, but the, the key thread between them is that the software, um, you can have it proprietary, but you cannot, or you can, you can sell the software, but you cannot have it proprietary. It means the source always has to be open for everyone. And the derivations license has to be GPL or a harsher. Now, to more practical knowledge, this has been a lot of legal jargon that people may or may not care about, but it's important to this aspect. So let's talk about more practical knowledge. Now, Git and version control systems. So version control systems, or VCS, are uh, tools to keep track of changes in software or text in general. Um, they're very, very good for collaborative work, and there's a bunch of them out there. Popular ones are like Mercurial or Git. Now, Git is by a wide margin the most popular. Uh, Git was created by Linus Torvalds, uh, the creator of Linux, um, because he was tired of another version control system that he was using. Um, so he created it. Uh, there are a lot of ideas that version control systems are new, but that's actually not true. Um, IBM had, uh, for their mainframes, the first version control system. I think it was back in the mid 60s. So they've been around for quite a while. Now, Kit uses uh, a special system of, uh, of keeping tracks of changes and all that stuff. The, some of you might be taking computer science classes and so you might know what a tree is, but uh, it uses the tree model. So you have nodes and edges between them. Um, it's defined by having a main branch, sometimes called the master branch or the main branch. And this branch uh, is the central like, trunk of the, the tree. And so every change can be based or modified around that branch. Now, each node that you see on the photo on the left, each node is uh, actually what we call a commit. Now, a commit is where you take your code that you've changed, you package it all together, and then you say, these are the changes that I made. It happened at this point in history. Now, there are other ways of doing other things. You see multiple different streams on the left on that photo. Um, those are called branches. Now, branches define uh, different isolated changes that go on with them. And branches are important because I want to make a change for a specific feature, but I don't want to mess with everyone else's work that's going on in the Git branch. And so I make a branch away from the one that everyone's working on, and then I do my changes, and then later I can merge them together. Now, basic Git terminology. There's a lot, but we're only going to cover the very basics. The first one is a pull. So a pull is, uh, just like that photo was showing, getting changes from a remote host. This could be a website like GitHub or another one like GitLab. You can set up your own server to do this. There's a bunch of ways to do it. Um, and push is pushing the changes from your machine to that server. 
Now, staging. Staging is the step before committing. What you do with staging is you take all your changes, you add them to this staging area, um, and then after that, you can write a commit and a commit message that goes along with it. Now, the next one is a branch. I've already talked about branches, but it is a series of isolated changes that can uh, be um, put back together with other branches that exist. A master or main branch, um, that is the core or the root branch. Normally, it is the first branch that has existed, and normally that's the one where people look at by default. Merging. So merging uh, is when you take two branches and you put them together, try them, uh, try to make them become one. But sometimes you get a merge conflicts. That's when uh, two branches have the same versions of uh, different versions of the same code or same file, and they're not compatible to go together. For example, I can have something that says print hello world, and I could pr have something that says print goodbye world, and those are not compatible because they're conflicted. So you have to do something called a merge conflict and get rid of it. So GitHub. GitHub is a website and a company that offers services built on top of Git. Uh, these services could include repositories, pull requests, permissions, groups, so on and so forth. There's a, a bunch of them out there, um, but there's one very big one, which I'll be talking about in a moment. GitHub also adds a, a social media portion with like following people, people and uh, starting projects and watching the changes that goes on in projects and all these things. So GitHub and Git differences. Uh, one moment. Yeah, Miranda said, um, whoops. Miranda said that she uh, struggles with conflict resolutions and uh, conflict resolutions are uh, always difficult. There is no easy way to get around them. Uh, the big thing is just you gotta be you got to know how the code works, uh, what your code does, and what this code that you're conflicting with is also doing. And you got to make decisions about what needs to be done to make changes for the features. So GitHub's big feature uh, that some people call it as killer feature is called a pull request, sometimes called PRs, or merge requests, also known as MRs. Um, they're the same thing. So that is adding a review process of people's code. So you can review their code, add comments and suggestions and all that stuff. Um, and so it adds this really nice ability to do big collaborative work. Now, merge conflicts have to be resolved manually looking line by line. Yeah, most of the time they do have to be resolved manually. Um, there are tools that help you resolve them, but they almost never work as intended. So you have to do it by hand, looking through all the changes. Yeah. So common files that you'll find in projects. The first and biggest one is a uh, readme. Um, readme.md, where the MD is Markdown. That is a, Markdown is a style, um, a way to write down text that has like a specific formatting. For example, Discord uses a uh, markdown so you can have like a uh, you know like bold letters or you can like like uh, do italics or stuff like that or like like a cross a strike through. Um, Discord has uh, some of them, Teams does also, but uh, GitHub has a full support for this stuff. And so it makes it really important uh, when you're writing code that uh, it lets you format and create documents that make it easier to read. Um, yeah, so it's always good to double check uh, tools that uh, how they work because sometimes it's like magic. You don't know what's going on. Yeah, so common FOSS files. So README is the biggest one. It normally has instructions on how to get started up, how to install the software, how to run tests, um, stuff like this. Uh, normally it also has a description at the top, the project name, uh, and whatever is important for people to know. It's uh, usually when you're starting with a project or you want to understand how it works, the first thing to do is read this file because it's really important. The next one is uh, contributing.md. So that talks about how to contribute. Uh, there's another one, uh, code of conduct. Um, code of conduct is very similar. You have uh, rules on how you can contribute to the software, steps that you have to do before, 
if you're planning on actually contributing to the software, this is a good one to, uh, to look at. Um, now support.md. Support.md is important. If you want to support the project for whatever it is, then it's a, it's a good one to use. It'll sometimes have like links on how to donate money or how to support in other ways. Um, architecture.md. Uh, yeah, having a habit of keeping feature branch sync with main and master prevents hard. Yeah, that's that's very good advice. Um, whenever you uh, you do a big push that you want to do a change, it's always good to pull the latest versions of the code and sync them up so you make sure that you don't have any conflicts beforehand. Um, yeah, architecture.md is really good at uh, explaining how the architecture of the program is. I have a standard layout that I like to use for projects, which is um, at the top, a little description of how it works. And then uh, what is called a code map where I explain important files and why they are important. Security.md, if you're writing a project that has uh, that could have security issues, um, which is almost all of them, security.md is a, is a really great file to have. It explains how to disclose information uh, safely or in any manner. Um, license could be all caps or in, or in lower case. Um, now license is just like the licenses we talked about before. Um, normally you have to define what license it is and then people go into the, to the actual file and see what license it is. So you have it defined or named just like this and then people would go in and they'd be like, oh, it's MIT license, I understand. Now git ignore is a bit more complicated because it doesn't have to do with just conventions. Git ignore is a special file specifically for Git. And as Git is made to track everything, Git ignore says what not to track. So this could be files that's uh, fit, uh, that's naming convention fits a specific pattern. This could be entire directories. This could be specific files under directories and anything in between. Um, yeah, it's a fairly important file to learn how to use, but it is actually not that complicated to learn. Now the dot GitHub directory, that's a, a GitHub only thing. And uh, the dot GitHub directory shows uh, templates for um, what are called uh, pull requests, or like if you're creating an issue, that's also a thing that Git has that, or GitHub has that Git doesn't natively have. And that will just uh, have a specific template that people can fill out. Um, there's a bunch of other things that go with it, but currently I only know it to do a templating for those things. And then changelog.nd or a changelog directory. Um, this is, as the name suggests, a changelog, a log of all the changes that is happening in your software, whether it is breaking changes, which is changes that break a specific API or how the program is used, or it is just minor changes or any changes in between. Um, it is good to write them all down in changelog.nd. So that's the end of this part of the presentation. Uh, the next part, I will have a demonstration doing a, a basic project on GitHub, uh, you know, pulling, making a little branch, and then um, writing some code and creating a pull request. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them right now, or you, know, you can ask whenever. I'll wait a few seconds uh, for people to ask their questions now. All right, I don't see any questions. So I'm going to switch over to my terminal. This is my terminal here, a fairly standard terminal, but I have to create a project. So I like to have what I call the project template. Um, these are standard files that I like to have. Uh, I'm not even using Arch Jeremy. I saw that. I'm using a Pop OS right now. Um, so yeah, these are standard. Uh, files that I like to have in every project and so anything in between. So .github, like I was talking about earlier, these are markdown files that have a specific template. So if I you know, create a pull request, this is what it'll look like. And then people can fill in in between and see all that stuff. Um, yeah, and then architecture.md. I like having a very specific layout for architecture.md. I think it is a very underrated 
um, uh, piece of documentation to have. I don't see it very often, but when I do, it's always nice to see. It has a architecture at the top. This document describes the high level of this project and then so on and so forth. Yeah, Stephen, we know that's not true. You know, you need to know how to code before you can use Arch. Um, and uh, contributing. So uh, um, <laughs> Stephen and I are friends. I'm not just being mean. Um, yeah, this is the contributing file that explains a process, a very simple uh, code of conduct and starting in issues and all that stuff. And uh, same with the README. This is a very, very, very basic bare bones README that I like to use. You have project name at the top, a warning that these instructions are for Unix-based systems. Not always true, but in my case, normally it's true. Uh, setup and then contributing and architecture. And then the last one is the license. I like to use MIT license because it has a bunch of freedoms. Uh, worst case scenario, I change it. Now there is a, a caveat to changing licenses. Uh, you need the permission and consent of every contributor to the software. For example, uh, the Linux like kernel, they've been trying to change uh, lost licenses for 15, 20 years, but there is hundreds, if not thousands of contributors, so they cannot because they don't have the consent of everyone. Now, Jeremy asked a great question. Why would you change a license? Why would you change a license? Well, sometimes you want to change the, the limitations of your software. For example, if I create a software um, that is super, super successful, but I create it under MIT, so anyone can take it, use it for private use, um, and the software is like extremely successful and I want, you know, money, um, a good way to do that is by changing it to a GPL or any other copy left licenses where people can't just use the software for free, but I, uh, they have to either, you know, keep it open source or pay. Uh, it's yeah. As Steven said, it's to change the restrictions of the software. Um, yeah, it's very important. Yeah, as um, the Scarlet Duke said, I changed the license uh, of one of my projects, but that was, uh, but I realized it was uh, the GPL was inappropriate for a library. Exactly. Uh, if you're creating a library, sometimes GPL is not the best thing to take because sometimes when you're creating a library, you want everyone to use it. But sometimes if you're creating a library, you want specific people to use it, GPL is good. And Miranda asks, if I change a license, does that affect the people that were using it previously? It can. Uh, it doesn't have to, though. For example, uh, there is a software called a Kodi. It's a video streaming software. Um, they were free and open, and then they eventually decided to uh, become closed source and proprietary software. So um, the software that was currently in use um, existed, and it was very nice. Um, people could take a snapshot of that called a fork or which is another type of branch and they can use that software to create something else and that software became jellyfin uh, yes the software this uh presentation is being recorded so now we'll go on to the actual demonstration itself um yeah so this is the css u windsor uh the u windsor css github page Oh, yeah. What about different? Uh, what do you think about levels of verboseness in readme files? Um, that's a good question. I think it depends on the actual software. If it's beginner friendly, uh, laying out specific instructions is important. But if it's something mega massive that everyone uses or is very simple, I don't think it's needed. It depends on the size of the project and uh, the target audience. For example, the uinsert discord bot um, it is specific and it is supposed to be you know beginner friendly so our readme is much more documented than other ones would be um, for example we have two sets of instructions on how to set up with or without docker and then we explain how to fix weird issues that happen sometimes yeah as steven said images are always nice um, there are some times that images aren't nice which is if you're using this in a terminal then you can't actually see the images unless you have a terminal that supports that, which not all do. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to create a new project. 
Oh, I see there. Uh, where will this be posted? Um, no worries about the questions. It's perfectly fine. Um, this will be posted on YouTube. Um, yeah, as Jeremy said, uh, links browser OP. Yeah, it's great. So I can call this whatever, demonstration. And then I can put a description, but I'm not going to, and I can make it public so we can all see. So I can add a readme file. I can add a gate ignore. I can automatically choose a license. Let me zoom in so everyone can see. Um, I'm not going to do any of this because I'm, I'm going to show you how to use a, a blank project. So let's create the repository. So it, it creates a small one right here. And then I can choose who I want to be collaborators to this. And then here I have a quick setup. So I can follow these instructions that it gives and I can show how to do it. Or I can just do an easier way, which I'll do right now. So I copied this link here. Um, now Git can communicate over many protocols, but its two biggest ones are HTTPS or SSH. Um, SSH has SSH keys. HTTPS makes you sign in almost every time. So this is the project. And let's go over to my terminal. So I can first git clone on the link. And then it's cloning it. Yeah, I, I cloned an empty repository. There's nothing there. So if I go into the demonstration, there's nothing there. Oh, this might be useful to see. I have a, a special thing in my terminal that shows what branch I'm on. Currently, it says master because I'm on the master branch. I can show this with get status. On the branch master, no commits. There's nothing here. So let's create a file. So let's do a um, vim readme.md. So we can put like demonstration. Uh, I, I'm not a very good speller, so if I uh, make a mistake, uh, so be it. I'm going to say hello. This is a fairly simple explanation of what's going on right now. Yeah, as uh, Stephen said, you can use git branch to show you what, uh, what you're on, but that's not always necessary. Um, oh, it, is that an extension for my terminal? Um, kind of. What I have done is I've used a software called uh, Starship uh, to create a custom, what's called a PSU. No, Jeremy, I won't show my VimRC. Uh, yeah, there, there's a bunch of softwares that can uh, show uh, a bunch of stuff on, uh, on Windows. A very common one is called Git Bash, which installs a type of terminal called Bash, as well as Git itself. Yeah, as, a, as someone just said that right there, they don't see master. So a while ago, GitHub uh, is trying to uh, decided that they were trying to get away from the term master for Git, for branches. Um, so now they use main instead. Um, I have set up the, the GitHub, uh, the CSS GitHub repos to use master by default. This is because uh, sometimes some software doesn't like using a main, like a root branch other than master. Sometimes it, it'll get a little upset if you use one like main. So I thought it would be easiest to get around that problem altogether and just use master. So as we can see here, I've created this file. Um, if we go, if we run git status, we can see what's been changed. So this is an untracked file. So git doesn't track it yet. And we can use git add and the file name to what is called staging. So let's do that really quickly. So git add, and then like this. So run git status again, we can see a new file that's been created. So this is currently staged. So if we commit, there's two ways to commit. You could do dash m with the message and pass on the string, or you can just do git commit, and it pops up this little window, and you can type whatever. So I can say add readme b for demonstration. Now I can save and quit. So now I've committed to the first part, the, the first commit to this. So this is the first state, like the first snapshot of this project. Um, yeah, so as Steven said, there's a git, <laughs> there's git add dot. So there's a lot of uh, ideas about this, but uh, the big ones is git add 
dot. That dot is a, what is called a, a regex all characters, and it doesn't include a deletions. So that can be an issue. So instead, if you want to add all the files that's been changed, you can do git add dash a. I believe there's also a commit uh, one. I think it's like git commit dash a m or something. I don't know it off the top of my head. I don't use it. So now, if we want to push, we would run git push. And there we are. So here we are at this, this uh, repository or repo. Um, as we can see, there's nothing here. Now if I reload the page, it'll show up. There it is. Perfect. So this is on the master branch. So we're currently committing directly to master. Yeah, I see that there. What is the difference between committing via the first way and the second way? So let's say I delete a file or um, or delete um, uh, delete a file or delete certain text. Git uh, add with a dot at the end does not always include that. Um, any benefit to a uh, to add uh, using git commit with the, without the dash m text? There is actually. Um, so a funny story. So when I started programming, that's the only way that I committed. Um, but now I never use it. So when doing git commits, there's a bunch of conventions uh, that are important. The first one is the first line has 50 characters at most. And it needs to be short, simple, to the point of the changes that you made. Um, then you have a space in between. And then you can have any size paragraph, like any number of lines. But it has to be 50, 70 characters max. Um, this is important because when people read through your Git history, or if they need to look for something, um, being very explicit about what's going on is much easier to read than like putting like made changes, made changes, had a typo. You know, if you explain what the typo was or what the changes were, it's important and it really shows up, uh, shows off the maturity of the project. It also becomes important later if you have any issues finding something or you want to roll back to a specific command. So right now we have, um, we're running on a, what is called a clean branch. Everything's all up to date. Yeah, so the Scarlet Duke said 70 characters max per line. Yeah, it's 70 characters max per line, um, but only in the paragraph line. The first line is 50 characters max. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, I'm not sure why it's this way, but it it is this way. <laughs> I'm not sure why. Um, so get status. So it says here we're working on a clean branch. Everything's already up to date with origin master. Origin is, you know, whatever server or remote host you're doing it with. In our case, we're using GitHub. If we run git remote dash V, we can see the fetch and the push. These are the same thing as pull and push. Fetch um, there is the pull and push is the push. And this is the URL that I am uh, pushing it to. So it would be git the user at github.com. And then this itself, like uwinsor CSS demonstration.git is the specific file. And so that's what it's working on. So if we go back here, you know, we can see this. Let's create a branch. So there's git branch, and then we've got these specific things. So git is very useful and also not like it's also kind of old, so it has very detailed explanations of what's going on. So here, great list. Uh, create or delete branches. So I can do this. If you do list, if pattern is given, then I use the shell wildcard to restrict. That's a lot of gibberish. I'm not sure the syntax about here, but let's do, nope. Okay, I need to Google this because I completely am blanking right now. Okay, so the add was not needed. I can just do tests like this. So this creates the the, the branch. Now the branch is created, but it's a uh, not going in. Like we aren't on the branch. As you see there, we're still on the master branch. So if we run get status, we can see this again on man on branch master. So let's uh let's call it check out, which means we go over to it. So get check out uh, test like this. And now we're on the test branch. Perfect. 
So the test branch is uh, currently the same thing as of the other branch. Oh, as Amon just said, uh, you can directly create and check out a branch using, yeah, that is, that is very true. You can do that. Um, sometimes you don't want to, but for the, the sake of uh, normal everyday work, yeah, that's pretty good uh, uh, practice to do. So that's, uh, now we're on the test branch. So now, it's, now let's create something. So if we run LS, we can see everything that's in here. So we have readme. So let's do readme. Let's, uh, this is new. So let's save and let's exit the file. And then now if we run git status, we can see that it's not modified. Now we don't know what has been modified. So we can run git if to show the differences. So it had some pluses and some green text to show what's been changed. So here it says, this is new with two new lines before it. That's exactly what we wanted. So now we can add it. We can do dash A, like Stephen was saying earlier. So now it's added. Uh, I set it up so the star means that we have uh, unmodified or uncommitted uh, changes. So now that we've done that, we can do get status to show what's there. This has been staged. And now we can do git commit. And then we can do dash M added some text for stuff. Now, if we go back to get status, whoops, we can show that we're on a clean branch. Now we are one commit ahead. So if we get push, it'll say, you got to do this stuff before it because it's not sure where it's pushing. So we do get push set upstream to origin of test. So what this is saying is you can push, uh, there's like a, a git history, you know, the big tree. So you can push this history to origin you know, the remote server from branch test. So that's exactly what we're doing here. So this is doing that, and there we are. Now, if we go back here, we can see test has pushed a minute ago. Would I like to create a pull request? Yes, I would like to create a pull request. So let's do that right now. So it takes the title and automatically puts it here. If you have a body, uh, if, like if you don't use dash M, the body would go here. So I can write like, this is a test. I am doing for demonstration. Beautiful. Now let's create a pull request. Also here we can add reviewers. So Amon at Shopify is uh, this Amon here. And it includes everyone that's currently in the, the GitHub group for uh, Computer Science Society. So let's create this. And um, right here it's checking. It did a check to show if it could be merged or not. So sometimes you can set restrictions that nobody can even push to the master branch unless you're an admin. And you're all, uh, pri uh, all uh, PRs have to be reviewed by an admin. It's currently how we have the, the hub, which is one of our projects for Computer Science Society. Um, so here, I can merge the pull request, or I can see the commits that's been done. One commit, I can see the files that's been changed and the changes right here. Um, but let's say I want to merge it. So I just click merge. I say the merge message and the, whatever I want here. And then I can associate with whatever email. So how it's been merged, I can delete this. I can even delete the branch. Let's go back here. Now we're on the master branch and it shows the new texture. And that's how you use branches. Now there's a bunch of stuff. Like a our tree is very tiny, but sometimes branch trees are like mega massive and you want to know what's going on. And it's really hard to visualize the entire thing. So there's a command that I've written down that shows it. So here there's basically nothing going on. You know, it has the star, which is the node of the commit, the what's called the commit hash. Um, then what's going on with the branches. And then the commit message, and then who was made by, and then when it was. So this project has basically nothing going on. But if we go to a project that does, uh, so this is the hub, or the Discord bot project that Computer Science Society runs. Um, we can see here all the the magic that's going on. So these explain branches like here. 
and then branches being merged together. So for example, Harsh, Harshdip, a friend of mine, he created a branch, made a commit and a pull request, and then here it was merged back right here. So if we scroll down, we can see all the stuff that's been going on with this. We can see projects or branches being like discarded and not cared about. We can see branches that people do care about and people worked on them and all that stuff. So um, yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's all I have planned currently for the presentation. If you have any questions, please go ahead. Okay. Yes, I can drop that command in chat. Um, I don't know how, but I will put it in the Discord. And people can ask me whenever. Okay, I figured it out. I can come here. Yeah, that command is uh, hefty, and I found it online uh, because I didn't want to remember all of that all the time. Yeah. Is it important to squash changes before merging a feature branch? Well, that depends. Um, is the is the feature more important than uh, the rest of the code base? If so, then I'd say not necessarily. But if you want the feature to integrate seamlessly with the entire project, then yeah, it's a uh, pretty great. Uh, it's pretty important to squash all the changes before. Squashing the changes is also known as um, resolving merge conflicts. What are some good uh, open source APIs and how to use them? Oof, there's a, a ton out there. Um, so it really depends. Um, there's a, I really like OpenStreetMap. Um, that was originally created by the GNU Foundation. Um, as his name suggests, it's all about maps and streets and data and all that stuff. And it's free to use and it's open for everyone. Um, I really like OpenStreetMap. There, there's um, thousands. Um, for example, the University of Waterloo has an open data initiative, which is open sourcing all the data about the university. And it's, uh, it's really good. And um, uh, CSS and, and me specifically, we wrote um, a, uh, what's it called? A, um, a report to, I'm forgetting the actual name, so I'm going to call it a report. A report to a, a proposal, that's the name to get a uh, open data at the University of Windsor. Um, it will be judged on at November 1st. And if it is important to you, then I, if you want it to happen and it's important to you, then I suggest you email your professors or Dr. Copti or Dr. Hauser um, to show your support because it's important that the faculty know that you know all students want this. So next question, um, two branches can be merged uh, other than, yes, to any branches can be merged to each other, not specifically to master. Um, they can be merged to master, obviously, or I mean, not obviously, but they can be, uh, but they can be merged into each other. Sometimes you can have like uh, 20 branches, each of them serving a specific purpose. For example, you can have one specifically for development and your main branch is specifically for releasing or the production version of your code. You could have one specifically for testing you could have one for specific features or anything in between. All right, next question. Uh, are there opportunities to contribute at open source on CSS? Yes, Jeremy, CSS president. There are many opportunities. Um, you, can, uh, you can contribute to any of these projects. Um, all, and all these projects are, I mean, they're, they're projects, so they're, they're, they all serve a function, but um, you can contribute to them. And if you have any questions or you want to learn how to contribute or you have an, a project idea that you think would fit well at CSS, you can talk to me. I'm always willing to help or listen. And um, before I was on CSS, I had an idea and I was really scared if someone was gonna steal it. If you have an idea, I'm not gonna steal it. I, I want you to know that. Um, yeah, okay. Yeah, you can, as, a, as Amon said, you can, can start by contributing to the hub. Uh, the hub is one of our websites uh, that we that we use. It's a, the big website that most people interact with. Uh, and as Jeremy said, wow, that wiki sure looks cool. Uh, the wiki is, um, is supposed to be the successor to the student guide. We are currently in development for it and it's currently going along. 
But uh, let me see if I can remember. Oh, I do not remember the uh, the URL for it. Is a uh, it's active on GitHub Pages. View deployment. There we are. Okay. Yeah, this is the wiki that we're currently working on. Um, it has a dark mode and a light mode. It's very pretty. Um, yeah, it'll for the time being it'll just be a port of our existing student guide, but broken up and organized a bit better. But eventually it'll turn into an entire wiki page to help not only CS students, but all students at the university. Yeah. Any other questions or statements or anything that anyone has? I'm, thank you, Miranda. Appreciate it. All right. Yeah, I, I am pumped too for the uh, the wiki. Um, it's a uh, slow to get going. Most of the engineering aspects about it are finished. But, uh, the actual writing of the articles are we're still working on it. Um, it's not a little amount of work, especially to get the ball rolling. But uh, hopefully, the wiki will have a more streamlined ability for people to contribute or add to it. Because um, currently, the hub, even though it's not super difficult, it can be confusing at times. And so we are really focusing on making this easily accessible for all students. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. We've, uh, we've worked very hard on this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. If you don't have any questions, feel free to post them on Discord. And eventually, I'll see them and I'll be able to you know, respond either there or you know, wherever. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's it for me.